Welcome to the Geometric View, Episode 4, Season 1. Please enjoy. Thank you for being here. Come one, come all. Let's see how many people thank we got. Thank Ooh, we you got Lori. Thank you all for having me. And uh, it's nice to be a part of uh, the conversation. Thank you for being here, guys. Hello. We have Lori. We have Tessa, we have Michael, Donald, or Doc Stars, and it looks like Sydney Twinning here. So typically it's uh, it's not a video, um, but if you want to stay on video, it's totally fine. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to hop right into it. Um, I thought this was at three. How you doing today? How's the weather out where you're at? Where you at, Sydney? Virginia, it, it's pretty good. Nice, welcome. All right, we got Michael Camaro here. Yes, sir. All right, we're just getting started, guys. Um, I am going to take over the screen. Let's see, share screen. And share your entire screen. And happy Saturday, everyone. Welcome to the Geometric View. It's nice to be here. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. All right. Okay. So today I kind of really wanted to hop right into diatomes. Um, if anybody's familiar with diatomes, um, I listened to a couple of documentaries yesterday to refresh some of my information about them. Oh, they're super fascinating creatures. Um, uh, they are, uh, I'm not sure if they're single celled organisms, um, but they are basically plankton. And there's a millions of these different shapes. Well, actually, I, I, I think there's around a uh, hundred thousand different types of shapes and every single shape is a different species <clears throat> and this it really fascinates me especially with uh eugene's deep biosphere or deep biome um ideas of uh extremophiles living along the fault lines and being responsible for earthquakes and different things and the skeletons of them fragmenting and building up and um, creating faults because really everything's living the more we look at it the, on all scales we see life so um these these diatoms are basically made of glass they're silicate and they live all over the world in different types of environments they live in mosses they they live and thrive right around specifically where the Birkeland current comes in on the planet here around the, the um, icy glacial regions. So um, I'll just randomly look up North Pole or whatever uh, images uh, they're here. They're basically uh, mitochondria that help uh, filter water and clean uh, Water. Yes, uh, and they're responsible. They they are responsible for like more more percentage of the oxygen in the atmosphere than the rainforest. Yep. And they're they eat the same stuff as plants eat. Basically, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, that type of thing. And they they're around the Arctic circles. Uh, specifically, they grow underneath glaciers on the leaching sediment um, and the leaching waters and stuff like that. Yeah, they're very important species. A uh, very important species, I'd imagine, to the planet. Buddy, uh, <clears throat> this is Doc Stars. Uh, quick question for you. Hey, Doc, how's it going, man? Good, man. How you doing? Doing good. Um, okay, so. Uh, I don't, have you guys heard of a book called Living Energies by Callum Coates? I, I, I've heard of Living Energies, the book, but no, I haven't heard of uh, I don't, I don't, that name doesn't ring a bell. So tell us. OK, so 
If I understand your line of inquiry correctly, I think what, what's happening is you're wondering why the differentiation among thiatomes, is that correct? Well, ultimately, I'm, I'm specifically interested in why, why is it so important for the planet to have these different shapes on, on a glass structure on, um, for so many creatures to consume? And it, and it goes it turns into sand and uh, and sand then goes into the Amazon and feeds the Amazon. It's just it's in all levels of uh, of of the geological scale and like it it really fascinates me. Why these shapes? Look at these shapes. <clears throat> um, Diversity among them. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I think it's a reasonable line of inquiry and, and I think it's worthwhile studying. Uh, from the perspective of our group, Sound of Stars, um, frequency technology, we've examined this phenomena. And from what we can ascertain, there's more than one reason. Uh, one of the reasons is similar to what you'll find in the book called Living Energies by Callum Coates. So in that book, um, what they do is they take a look at shape differentiation that occurs among trees found at different latitudes and longitudes but specifically where there's extreme differentiation to heights and width uh, with trees uh, in relation to elevation. Okay, I so, think I've seen the image that you're talking about. Uh, what's his name? Living Energies uh, by? Callum Coates. C-A-L-A-M? Yeah, C-A-L-L-U-M, and then last name is C-O-A-T-S. Let's see here. Okay. All right. Someone suggested this for me before. Yeah. Or and, maybe and, I've seen it. Sure. Sure. So what, what you'll see is in that book, he, pre, he presents diagrams, uh, some pretty robust data. It's probably one of the few books out there on Schellberger um, that just has hmm. this level of expertise. Okay. Uh, yeah. But what you'll see in there is diagrams of tree shapes. And then he also talks about um, important factors related to, uh, I, if I remember correctly, CO2 um, uh, levels in the atmosphere present to the different shaped trees, and then also the level of infrared that's around the trees in these areas. But the point that he makes is just that the position of a species on the planet itself uh, in relation to things like elevation, etc., cetera, um, are huge in defining its shape. But then the other thing is, one of the things that we've found uh, in our research, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it now, um, but what happens is that different kinds of species, uh, and even uh, certain kinds of subtypes within um, genuses or species, will differentiate um, in relation to frequency orient orientation and affinity. And I think, uh, I think that probably one of the reasons you're interested in this subject, if I'm going to take an educated guess, mm -hmm. is that you, pro you probably are already intuiting these kinds of things because uh, it would be uh, complementary in some of your ideas about the Doherty set. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's that, that's just one thing I wanted to toss out there. Um, I'm just digging up some other things for you guys, but I thought I would just mention that to you, and I'll, I'll throw the the ball back to you guys. I'm gonna just mute my mic here. All right, uh, that's that's some some great uh, topics to to hop into and to move around through. Um, one of the things that my mind were, went right to was something I wanted to touch base on a, a while ago was this infinity theory here where it all has to do with these recursive recursion uh, loop feedback loops, and it's all vortical. This is vorticity. Uh, the, his science, uh, this is Peter. Uh, Peter is uh, part of, well, I met him through the electric universe paradigm. Um, and we used to have him on the electric view. So his work is is great. There's, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot that shows uh, here's his forms. Oh, no, that's the forum, like literally. Okay. 
interior bridges, exterior tunnels. This is really good stuff. Um, so I guess chirality. good, uh, Mr. James. Absolutely. Hop in, so, anybody, anytime. Um, so I guess also another way of looking at it would be is you're, con- you're interested in how the different reoccurring wavelength structures are being, uh, I guess, are, are have, uh, evolving. And um, you want, are trying to figure out in how you're, by using that, because it, it, it's a, a, a total field that's electrically charged, you know, it's just smaller models of a bigger model. Um, so it would make sense that there would be every different type of structure and, you know, as it expands and, uh, and being encompassed um, by the visual spectrums that you're interpreting from your perspective. Uh, yes. I mean, or something like that along those lines. Is that uh, what you're asking? Uh, well, re- we started the show with talking about diatoms um, and the shape of diatoms. And uh, we just started li- literally, so you're at the beginning here. Um, and we're we're basically going into why is it so necessary for life to have so many different variety of shapes to consume as a diet uh, for yeah. for nature to to this is necessary in the silicate form, this glass. Why is it necessary for whales and so many other creatures, including us to to consume these and why the variety of shapes and the specific shapes in general themselves. Um, and, and then I, I, as I was studying this, I realized that there's no closed shapes in nature. Nature usually produces open shapes. Even humans are open and most biological living creatures are open. Even in a, an egg uh, it's open so that oxygen can get in there in the, Uh, fetus can breathe and there's open ends on these there's open ends on every single individual cell it's an open source system it it shows it's showing that there's an open source system and things are not closed sourced uh closed I, i i'm actually possibly stating that nature doesn't create closed shapes it's all they're all open and if you look at it, the flower is open and it closes. Like, uh, Life is like open and it like closes. An event, like an event horizon type thing where the creator and creation or pre-metacognition, pre-metacognition and visual interpretation and creation kind of meet. Or... Can, can I Yes, think... go ahead, Heather. Hi. Um silica in a plant I'm, I'm, I'm a gardener by trade and silica in a plant is generally used to build the, the structure of it and it builds like the structure of the cells so when something is absorbing light when something is at a specific place and it needs to absorb a specific spectrum of the light it will build the shape that allows it to reflect the and, and absorb the proper uh, frequency of light so that it can met- metabolize it into sugars. And there's actually a um, formula for the amount of CO2, um, UV light, and temperature for optimal growth that gives you a chart of like how big things should be. And I cannot remember it um, off the top of my head right now, but if anybody can remember that, that would be awesome. But it, but there is like a specific ratio formula that, that determines uh, rate of growth per species in relation to the amount of CO2 and light given. So Okay, so that sounds that there. sounds like something that Sorry. would be in Guys, inside of Jeffrey West book the scale that sounds like uh yeah. Okay. Guys, I just want to I just want to jump in for a sec. This is Doc Stars again. Who was just speaking? This is Heather. Yeah, hey, hi, uh, I'm, hi, I'm Heather Stark. Is there nice to meet you? Yeah, hey Heather. Um I I would I would suggest that Heather's correct in going in the right direction. One of the one of the ways that you can confirm at least part of what she's saying, if if you're not familiar with this, and buddy, this is 
another piece to the puzzle that I think you're seeking. It's a book uh, by a fellow named Kervran. And Kervran uh, was doing experiments with silica. He wrote a book called Biological Transmutation. It's Lewis Kervran. And so one of the things that he had done was that he had uh, either restricted or included a significant amount of silica when he was feeding basically um, chickens. And so what he found was that when the, uh, and some people have conjectured that there may be kind of a transduction process somehow that's happening in the body with the ingestion of um, silica, but certainly there's a profound capability of transmutation and, and transmutation in the sense of taking silica in as a kind of, you know, uh, conceptual base elements and then transmuting, uh, transmuting that element into other literally into other elements. So what I would suggest is uh, check out his work, um, the book, Biological Transmutations. I think it's out of print. A, a lot of the clues that I suspect that your community and other communities are looking for have been somewhat removed from the public domain slowly over time. Mm -hmm. um, but if you know where to look, uh, you start to be able to patch these things together. But I, I just wanted to say that I, I thought Heather was on, and I'm going to duck out. Of, I, I'm going to still be here, but I'm just turning my mic off again. That's that's incredible. And I was making that connection at the beginning of the show here, how uh, the what diatoms look for, they're all over, but there's spots that they're they don't exist because there there's lacking magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium, and and other elements that they eat, so they don't go around those areas in the ocean. Um, and there, and that's very, very much similar to plants. Their exact diet is what plants eat, and then they produce the oxygen. So I'm looking at Birkeland currents and how how the energies are coming in, and they're creating these glass silicate structures into um, like uh, sonobio sonobiology, like sonoluminescence. But the sounds are what create the sounds from the Birkeland currents on, on microscopic levels could be creating these necessary types of shapes um, when you get into somatics oh. and and you look at the the types of shapes that are created um, you could really see that uh, that where these thrive where diatoms thrive are right at the top of the poles so so and you can see they take on very similar shapes to some of um, the somatics uh, images here which pops me right over to Gabriel Kaliman, if you've heard of him, anybody. His work is absolutely amazing. He's, I believe, he might even be a doctor, but anyway, uh, he, he's been on TED and other things. He's a cymaticist, but then he uh, started sculpting the shapes after working with them for so long. And when you look at his work, you start to see the similarities in flow networks uh, open systems, not closed systems, uh, the geometry of open systems, and because that's what it is, it's all vorticity. So if we, the more we hop into studying vorticity, the opening and closing of worms, tubes, vibrations, frequencies, fractals, the repeating of one shape over and over and over and over to create a shape that's in the center uh, we realize that everything is made out of sound. So, so what, um, sound uh, vibrations. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is Sydney. Dubitably. Hey, what's yeah. up, Sydney? How you doing? Well, Can I we talked about that, Walter Russell. Uh, yes. I recognized that pattern, and I was looking it up while you were talking about it, and then you started talking about what I had looked up. And if you look at, so. I understand a little bit how these patterns are made because I was working with it in uh, electronics to the extent when you like, for instance, when you see those plates with the sand on them, where the sand is, is where, the energy, is, is where the energy is not. Yes. So what I'm seeing in these uh, diatoms is that their walls are where the energy is low, where the material can settle and work and connect together on molecular level. So when you see that certain pattern, the, the spaces between the patterns, that's where the waves are. 
and they're knocking everything around and it's not able to settle within itself. But then where it settles, which is in between the waves, in between the standing waves, that's where you're going to see the material appear. And the material as it appears is then going to affect the waves as they go through the uh, organism, you know, ac across it and into the interior uh, to an extent. So these waves can be uh, sonic or uh, electromagnetic, and they can be um, more than just a simple sine wave. Now, when they do those sand patterns, they're just putting simple sine waves in there, so you get a very basic pattern. But in nature, it isn't really a simple sine wave. It's more complex than that. You can have ripples on the sine wave. You put certain ones together, you'll get a square wave or a triangle wave, for instance which that doesn't happen in nature either. You know, we just do that in experiments. But you'll see harmonics of a base wave making a, a certain shape. And then what I'm seeing in this is that shape is then developed as a result of those waves. Now, the other thing you want to remember when they do these sand plates, that's only two dimensions. But with these organisms are being made in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So the shape of the wave actually has a three-dimensional shape and uh, rare to anyone looks at it. I've been um, you know, trying to figure this out for, for a while. That's, that's actually... I had some uh, discussions, discussions with some people about it at um, Boone, North Carolina in a intentional community we're working on. Nice. Yeah, that, that reminds me... Um... Oh, man, I lost it right where, right when you oh three dimensionally um, dolphins and how they cast uh, um, signal transmission and signal beam propagation they they beam signals and they three dimensionally sculpt it uh, sculpt the images and do I'm stumbling on it uh, John John is his name um, that does the cymoscope. Yeah, you, uh, you mean John Reed? Yeah, John Anthony Reed. Yeah. Cymoscope. Yeah. Okay. So what he his work that he's been doing is he realized that that like if I were to show the Doherty set to a dolphin, they could take that information or a three dimensional version of the Doherty set to a dolphin, they could take that information and turn it into a sound wave and and then retransmute it into a three dimensional image. We can take that three-dimensional image and 3D print it. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that is possible. Yeah. yeah. So they actually make a 3D image out of a standing wave structure, out of just the, the minimal energy, the minimal shadows that they have to deal with. Like a smart learning program w would take, a, uh, you, can, you can build 3D images off of a picture now, a face because of the shadows and stuff like that. That's what the dolphins do. They take it, they build the image, then they reanimate it into a three-dimensional blob of uh, Sima, uh, like a... See, now, now you're making me think maybe plants are like like three uh, like 3 d printers for the, the frequency of light or the shape of light that's necessary. It is, yes. You get like, yeah. like building this out of the silica frequency because I've been like I've been studying I don't mean to interrupt you but like no, I've been studying for right a while about, about the frequency of light and what the color of light um demands from or what the plant demands from the color of light and vice versa and and does this does the specific frequency call to a specific mineral and and so when the plant needs a different mineral or the light changes um it changes its shape to accommodate and and why you know why does that happen in our specific light frequencies? Well, we know specific light frequencies are the trigger for that, but um, is is it more than just um, in, in plants? Right? Is it, it like what exactly is it that's that's pulling pulling this? Because I've noticed that um, like a lack of a specific growth color during a bloom season will take all the nitrogen out, but if you supplement that same blue color, then it will continue to metabolize nitrogen. So uh, that's just something interesting that I got excited about. Oh my gosh, Heather, that was the most ridiculous and perfectly right on point thing. Um, I, I think you said it right. The, the plants are working as 3D printers for the, the sun, individual Birkeland currents. 
like basically what's happening i think um is uh, earth is reanimating light individual Birkeland currents that come from the sun that are already nested with with um with a pattern a pattern's already there and that open pattern is already rearranged or stacked in a certain manner um i can go to the chat here and open up i didn't want to hop into this just yet but how do I get to the chat right here? Okay, open up conversation. Um, I love the holography theory. Just, just comment. I love the conversation also. So, oh, okay. Anyway, uh, okay. This is this is these are wrapped up individually. Uh, wrapped up Birkeland currents that are coming out of the sun that are nested inside of each other and they can only harmonically nest in a certain fashion and we understand this helical energy and the de deliverer of uh, the messenger of the gods is mercury as this helical uh, cord throughout um, ages and different gods or whatever but that's neither here nor there what I'm saying is this these these tubes are individually uh, uh, break up the ideas from the sun, the ideas from the sun being perpetual throughout the, the universe. And they break it up into smaller and smaller and smaller ones. And then eventually here's, here's one type of plant. Here's another type of plant. Here's another type of plant. Here's another type of plant. And it breaks it down into the mycelial network all the way into the floor. If you ask what the purpose of everything is and you really look at the long standing structure of what the earth is, it seems like the earth is amending the soil for something. It seems like the earth is all about the soil, but what is so important about the soil? Um, if you take the creatures as, as purposeless and you just kind of go with the flow and we're like the earth could be the gut fauna of the solar system, the gut flora fauna of the where where this the sun being the mind or the 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 bigger part of the organism and us being the gut fauna um ultimately it comes down to uh my mycelial networks that are all working uh and this is where the idea of morphogenetic re uh, morphogenetic i uh resonance comes from rupert sheldrake gives the credit to the community, which because they came up with it, the mycelial community, because they were looking at mushrooms and how they spontaneously flower after lightning strikes them or certain indicators. All of a sudden, it's, it's a, it's, it doesn't seem like one organism, but then at the same time, it fruits. It all fruits at the same time. And he was really interested in the mind behavior, the global mind behavior of the organism um, not Rupert, but other scientists back in the 30s. And and so you take it and you break it all the way down and it comes to like hairs. We can only sense the feeling of touch because of hairs on our body, majority. Um, majority is, is of it is hairs. But even the dendrites of our nerve endings and our nerve fibers are in a hair-like branching structure. And going with hairs and going along with cilia, not silica, but cilia, which is really weird and grows into bones and like rhinoceros noses and tusks and ivory and different teeth and whatever. But hair itself in the ears is what allows us to hear. Hair allows us to touch. I think hair is really what the cones and fibers are at the back of our eyes that allows us to see. Um, hairs in our lungs the cilia allows us to breathe and it's constantly being scrubbed and replaced so why is it hairs and then the hair of earth is like the plants all of the plants and all the trees are the fur of the earth the earth is furry you know on some of the land and and that's hair if you look at it that way and and now heather's talking about it being um like the 3d printer of silica um and i didn't know so much silicates were bit, were used to build the structure of trees. So just some ranting here. 
And anyway, I wanted to talk also about the bubble sculpting and the sculptures that I'm making because they're so similar to the diatoms and their minimal energy configurations. And this is this is like the top the top of Saturn, like the hexagon, and it's an open shape. It's an open shape pinched on all sides, re repeating hourglass shape. Then you pinch it in the center with a tube or a ring current, and it pulls it together in a hexagonal type of shape. So this vortex type of structure could be responsible. Then I made one with three, one with four, one with five, one with six. The five seems to be a really um, stable structure out of these but they're all stable but these are minimal energy configurations these shapes that are being created they're they are by nature um breaking down into minimal uh they use the least amount of energy to create these these shapes am i still on guys okay yes <laughs> all right just making sure just making sure it got really quiet so yeah. yeah, that was just some thoughts that I had, uh, and I'm making them literally with the bubble sculpting. It's freaking crazy. Start it again. Can you repeat what you said, please? Oh, just um, there's this experimental theorist called named uh, David. I'm gonna try and pronounce his last name best I can. Schwimmer. Sh oh, David Schirmeyer. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed you. him Thank a couple times. So yeah. I and uh, how he made a, a oscilloscope just with the light source, a speaker, and a bubble. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and how eloquent it was, you know, for to be able to see sound in that manner. I just thought it was amazing. Um, so... Oh yeah, he's a very interesting cat. I love to interview him. Um, he's all he's very productive uh, and and prolific. He's always creating something new. Um, yeah, a lot of people have their eye on him right now. He's doing some good things. And then you have uh, Kelvin Abraham, who is uh, great in uh, topology. I believe it's called the uh, kinetics of energy. Mm -hmm. And how 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 it all charges your silica, or the silica, you know, kind of encapsulates your projected idea and vision. Ooh, okay. I haven't heard of this one yet. Um, that's a Calvin Abram. Yeah, he. Yeah, I'm familiar uh, with some Ab of his work. Abraham. Yeah. Yeah, Abraham. I, I'm trying to get him on the show. Actually, we've been reaching out to him. Are you sure? Yeah, we, he should definitely be talking to us. He is very uh, intuitive, perceptive. Um, and Walter Russell, I have also always found as a great reference for um, your whole structure of uh you know bio um i'm stumbling stifling sorry of your uh bio uh sonobiology yes yes i suppose if you want to call it yep i talked with matt presti this morning uh yeah my st my i have my work in the university of philosophy right now um in the walter russell museum in Waynesboro, Virginia. If anybody wants to go check it out, it's not going to be there for too much longer, maybe till June. Because so I was part of, out. yeah, I was part of the grand opening and uh, I'm good friends with all those fellows. Uh, been out there a couple times doing some volunteer work and stuff. So uh, I, I had to go see for myself what's going on with Russell's legacy and the people that are holding on to it and who these people are and I size them up, uh, you know, for size them up for myself to see what these people are all about. And when I met Matt Presti and I started to realize the heart, soul, blood of the man, I started to realize uh, this guy is what this university needs. And that's the only reason why that museum is up and functioning right now. He is so ardent and such a walter russell um 
enthusiast and diehard that he's he's keeping the vision alive, open, and well. And there's nobody that could do it like him. I can speak high, highly, high praise about him because the museum is gorgeous. And while there's the amount of work there, I couldn't, I was there for three, four days and I couldn't see everything. I didn't have time to see everything. It was just, it was in like really. I, I can't express my gratitude for you helping with those, with those projects. They really are. Thank really you. Necessary. You know? I appreciate that. I, I, it's good to, um, it's good to have someone out there, uh, thankful for the work that that I'm doing because I don't even believe it's work. It's just I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to. I see this. This is a vision, and you know, I, I had the outstretched hand of God touch me with the geometry. I know what it feels like to be touched, and I want everybody to have that feeling and connected connectedness, and um. I don't, I rarely talk about God often. I've done it a couple of times on this new podcast because I don't care. It doesn't matter what your view or your vision is. You can, we can be open. We have an open uh, mic here for anybody who wants to talk about their, uh, their specific uh, religion or viewpoint with, um, cause all of it has to do with geometry. Geometry is in all religion. So. so I mean, I, I see the higher consciousness and our collective being is sort of, if you want to call it a God, you know, because um, our thought waves are kind of like pressure that, that works to help mm -hmm. create a disbalance and yes. a harmony of the universe to, you know. Our thought waves are kind of like this. See you thinking in the center here's your thought waves your waves reach out like dendrites you know your etheric plasma body your extra organelle like this one's you thinking about your job this one's you thinking about something else this one's the strand you know like donnie darko where the vortex is coming out of the stomach and everything is created with with wrapped up open source geometry of really vorticity nice. it's these open it's like open shapes should. Yeah, that people aren't really talking about yet. When you look at open shapes, then you start to see we're connected. We don't end. Where does the beginning or the end of our body start? You know, we have nothing but holes in our body. And, and time spaces, whatever you want to call it, who knows? We're like bubbles in an ocean, I like to think of it. It was told mm -hmm. to me by a friend once. And just following the pattern of the total field and expanding the consciousness as far as you can you know to see the grander scheme of the patterns what's that guy's name where science started is it copernicus well, i looked it up the other day i was just uh, he had a vision yeah. yeah he had a vision and the scientific method started in 1600s what's his name guys descartes okay Descartes version of uh, reality is similar to what you just said, like bubbles and uh, I'm a bad speller. So I just go like this and a slow typer. So go like this. Well, actually I'll go to images because dude, this is literally, this guy had a dream, a series of dreams. And this is where like science and optics and like the, the, um, the beginning of skepticism started and the scientific method and I'm looking for his universe model. Yeah, dude, look at that. These are his drawings. Bubble sculpting, Terrence Howard, Shout out to Terrence. This is all, this is the visions that Terrence had. And he taught me how to bubble sculpt. That was, it's his method of sculpting. He literally taught me how to do it. But he's got so many other shapes that he's done. And all the shapes that I'm doing, I'm finding to be open, open. And I'm like, open-ended. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're all hyperbolic. But then when I look at it, I'm like, you know, a lot, almost all these 
uh, the geometry of these diatoms are hyperbolic as well, you know, and you look at Terrence's work and the stuff that he's working on and Terrence used to think about what the shape of bubbles and what happens when they meet and the surfaces meet. And that's how he came up with being able to do bubble sculpting. So this here is Descartes model. And he's thinking the same along the same kind of lines here. And this looks like a Birkeland current with uh, planets and, you know, a vortex type of model to me. So. It's a beautiful world. Right? Yes. Yeah. Feel free. Anybody to uh, ch chime in at any time. Um, just going through some of these basics. I want to get into Hans Alfian's galactic circuit, which we will later. Uh, and some models that I've worked on with that. Uh, and also Eric Lerner's model um, of black holes, quote unquote, black holes, uh, active galactic nuclei. Yes. So, <laughs> Michael, you made a good point earlier where these are, we're seeing these on two dimensional scales imagine a three-dimensional one like what would this shape look like moving in in space you know like from a collective view you mean what would this what would one of these shapes just look like moving in space basically like um like suspend uh, acoustic like you aren't sharing your screen buddy Oh, I'm not? No. Oh, dang. Thanks for telling me. Now All I right. know, guys. All right. Here we go. All right. Yeah, because I got I got cut off there for a minute. I'll have to fill that with filler. Um, so water and acoustic field. Acoustic levitation. Uh... Uh, videos right here. This is kind of what I'm talking about. This and three dimensions. Oh, look, it's our hero, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Skip. I'm sure we're all familiar with this, but look at diatoms and like I'm saying, sonobiology, the creation of these shapes being each individual fundamental threads that are coming off of Birkeland currents. The glass shapes are just the glass houses and they're that structure because that's the, the individual filament or sound. Same with the trees, same with the plants, same with each individual body and each individual atom. The solar cycle is wrapped up helically into um, into a series of interwound uh, uh, tubes, and they nest in harmonics only. Um, and and the the nesting of them are in harmonic ratios having to do with quaternion symmetry. Yeah, I love this idea because I. I going back to the same thing with the plants and the color of light and then the is there is there a light indicator for the evolution um of of species not not just humans and plants but i mean there's like these these great die-offs right and then and these great evolutionary leaps where all of a sudden the whole species will die uh population the whole species uh, will die off the yeah that's the word yeah. i'm looking for it like suddenly, yeah completely changes and, and is right. that related to our position in the solar system or like the space weather and what uh what electromagnetic frequencies are coming in or it, it, it does it does, how how much does that actually affect the physiology and the metabolism and it, is it cause for evolutionary change and for special dieback is there some place in history where we can say like the solar system was doing this and then this happened and it and it had to do with the the way that our our maybe just our water or, our, or the elemental 
fixtures within our body have to readjust to acclimate to the new um, electromagnetic atmosphere, environment, whatnot. Uh, yes. It's like, it's like there is a reaching out filament. And when the filament is snuffed, that species is gone because of the, the stacking, the creature stacking order or plant stacking, plant nesting order, the, um, the species nesting order. I'm going to show you guys a picture here based off of uh, what I'm talking about that I shared in another group, if I can get to there. Hey, buddy, it's Doc Stars here. I just had a quick question. Um, yeah. Uh, how, how long are you guys wanting to go for? Uh, usually however long people are, uh, are, are feeling it. Oh, okay. So, um, do you have like a, are, are you likely to go for about another 20, 30 minutes? Is that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Usually we go for about two and a half hours. Sometimes oh, okay. it ends up being about that long. Cool. Uh, I occasionally smoke natural tobacco, um, and I'm just getting a craving. I'm going to just go have a, it's a natural tobacco cigarette here. Uh, but I'll be back in a few minutes, and then uh, I'll jump in with you guys again. Sounds great. Okay, cool. So uh, I was going to show you guys this image. Um, I shared it a couple times with some other groups and another and some other threads. But it's basically an image of nested filaments. And I kind of showed the image earlier, and I was talking about it. Um, so for for the viewers sake, they could go back in the video. Um, but this is kind of what Heather, Heather was talking about, like species come into existence and go out of existence all the time. Um, after, uh, after a catastrophic event that kills the majority of the creatures, there's rapid speciation events afterwards. Like the sun is preloaded cognitively with all types of different, um, memories uh already in the filament thread uh and this is my thinking that the geometry of things is already there and and in order for new in order for the advancement of intellect and the ability to become full circle for the circuit to complete its loop the the universal or circuit or galactic circuit to complete its loop, it has to create all of these types of uh, beings. And these, we collectively are the beings. So in, in the cycle of electromagnetism, humans are just one step in the cycle of light. Um, and I think the, the Doherty set definitely sh shows the dynamics of, of it, being the to the matter of fact that if humans were down to a certain type only a certain amount of people on earth we would grow a new we would we could turn into a new being or if there were so many of us on earth we could turn into a new creature um this happens with locusts there's a locust behind me on this uh this insect beetle collection that i have and locusts are different from grasshoppers in that grasshoppers are only grasshoppers until there's a swarm of them. Then they change. They keep the same DNA, same, D, same DNA, but they change structures and hop up to a different size. Uh, and, and this would be like uh, jumping a new magnitude, changing magnitudes or the next dimension of creature. Right now, we're we're building new brains. We are, are according to our theories about brains and how brain development works. We build new parts of our brain. So right now, we're we're building a new part of our brain on the prefrontal cortex. So it's currently being built. Um, but if there were a certain amount of humans, and then all of a sudden we turned into a new creature, that sounds apocalyptic, and that sounds like. Uh, you can only keep this the you there's a barrier where humans can only exist and not not destroy the civilization up to like 250 i think i can't remember the name of what the number is but 
there's a there is indeed um, a a number, and there's like these levels. There's these levels and thresholds to where you get to it, and then you skip to the next one. You hop up to the next creature. You become the next thing. You or the um, the food source becomes scarce, so you start walking erectus up, you know, in a way ish along those. I'm not saying I fully believe in any of fully any type of theory or any way or, or the other, but you can see that when food sources change, you can change humans. They're already doing this with our food right now with GMOs. They're changing us. Um, if you read the back of any Snickers, uh, it will say uh, that it's it, it is partially created with geoengineering. When you look up what geoengineering is, geoengineering is to create um, or an advanced uh, uh, cellular behavior or an advanced type of person for um, basically a, an, a, a drug enhanced, some sort of a drug enhancement like p steroids for people taking, turn someone into a certain person, steroids turn someone into a certain person, these GMOs inside of the food turn people into certain people and it changes the structure you can go from one walmart to another walmart to another walmart and see that the people around there look different because i don't know if it's the water that they're drinking but you can go topologically from variance to variance to variance to place to place to place and if you put a white person in in like uh asia i wonder if they start gradually after generation to generation start looking more asian um, even if they were to breed with only uh, Caucasians, you know, elevation and different, I don't know, just kind of talking about different transmutations. So anybody want to pick it up? I mean, adaptation is a whole part of living, right? And self-sustainment, like you're talking about in uh, diet. Diatoms? Yes. Are, uh, you know, self sustainment is the uh, recurring wavelength that is life. You know, um, that's why we we breed, right? It's to keep our frequency awake and charged. Just drop my mouse. And evolve. But yes, you made a good point. Breathing. That's also another reason why the system has to be open. There's there's no closed there there's no closure. There's no closed systems. It's connected, 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 connected. Um because it has to breathe and or well, a pulse pulsation. I, I, I actually said breed, but yeah, oh. breathing too. I mean everything has to do with recurring you know, habits to help expand, to further, you know, project our, you know, goals or destinations or positionings and, or however you want to see it. Well, if you will look at the lifespan of any creature, it's, it's projective geometry. It projectively grows. Any plant projectively grows it's it's and the geometry of um of succession or the geometry of progression is the same thing as what the it, the doherty said is progressive geometry so but there are there are incidents of like is, isolated species that you know like you're talking if like okay so it made me think of two things if there was like a white person who only bred with other white people in a in an Asian environment. You're saying, and then eventually those people might be Asian. I don't. I don't like. There's actually proof or cases that would say no to that. That I don't know. I just, I was just questioning. Well, yeah. But but also um, during one of my sculpture classes uh, in college, we went to this, we went to this um, foundry, and there was there was a big Pieta sculpture there that was to go into a local cemetery and if you really looked at the face of of the mother mary and jesus they had like like more asian features and um he said that what happens is that 
there it's like a replica of a replica of a replica of a replica and and for us as sculptors um you will always kind of or, or artists of any kind you'll, you'll always kind of like see a little bit of that person of the artist's features in the face of the subject or in the body of the subject like because we are the most familiar thing to mm -hmm. us we feel ourselves we know we know where our angles are so eventually the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy became asian but that was that was through human work that you know what i mean that wasn't yeah like a, just like breeding dogs yeah. right yeah different species of dogs when is it that was something we've created that way or when is it hang on one second i'm gonna answer this during the show just to shame brighton hey what's up brighton hey dude, hey, dude we're, we're on the show right now I, you're live <laughs> Uh, so say hello to the group. Hello, everyone. <laughs> you want to, um, I, I just answered just to see if you were going to be on the uh, call or not. Yeah, uh, this is Saturday at 1 p.m. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll go on step right now. Yeah, hit us up, man. All right, we'll see you here. All right. Yeah. All right, bye. Cool. Um, so we got Brighton. Uh, anyway. So you were saying something amazing, Heather. Uh, remind me, please. I, maybe it was in my head. I don't know. So, uh, I think we were getting into uh, exponential growth and yes, yeah. yeah. Euler, exactly. What's 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 Euler's our number? Euler's number is is growth. Uh, so, oh, or you look at just yeah. Yeah, so so you look at Euler's number and, and what growth is and the fractal of growth, and it is the exponential. So Euler's number is the exponential, which is the how nature tends to grow. So ex exponential of an increase becoming more and more rapid. Doesn't that sound like nature? Mm, exponential. Mathematics of or expressed by a mathematical exponent. An exponential curve, exponential curve. So you see that life is exponential. And you look up Euler's number. Ooh, yeah, maybe it's yeah, method. It, it, you know, because it's symmetrical also. Or it should be. Uh it's all, it's all, it's in balance. It's, uh, yeah, there's a radial teeter symmetry to it. Teeter, teeter totter. <laughs> yeah, there's a bilateral symmetry to a lot of things in life, but then there's a radial symmetry to it. Like all of the diatoms seem to have this radial symmetry to them where you can well, axial, see, axial symmetry where you can rotate it on its axis. Right. And then, and then they also have, he, one, one, one more second, they also have helical symmetry. Um, I'm finding a lot of the uh, diatoms have helical symmetry at the center here in the corkscrew. Like a so, turtle, like a turtle. They're, well, they're calling it helical symmetry. I guess I heard I, I heard them refer to that um, on listening to the diatome uh, show yesterday documentary. I have an interesting picture that I'd like to share. Yeah, please share it to the group. Put it on the chat. I will. It has the uh, how the helix is just another form of you know frequency, of course, and can be uh, altered with the. Uh, I believe DARPA is going into uh, altering human frequencies and genomes. Oh yeah, everybody is man. Everybody but me. I could care less. I just want to talk about how cool it looks. <laughs> <laughs> No, just, <laughs> there is there is a means an end to the means here there is all sorts of visions that i have of of uh things that can be created to to extract light core samples and reanimate light so we can go into the web of life through fossilized neural networks that i call the i3 and things like that uh, they can be built other people are going to start building them um, it doesn't really matter to me. It's just another scope. It's an, it's going to be a scope that we uh, that we are able to see, but experientially, we'll be able to go into it like neurally, like neural net with Elon Musk. Also, I mean, there's also 
probably a negative aspect for this. Oh, for people. sure. There always is. Yeah. yeah. Can't cope. But that's a my little audition picture. Oh, let me see it here. I'm sharing my screen still, right, guys? Oh, wow, we got all sorts of good images here. Okay, looks like Michael shared this one. Yep, that's about it right there. I uh, hope Brighton joins soon because uh, Brighton is animating this literally as we speak. He's animating these fields, um, which are also present inside of every wavelength inside of the Doherty set. That, um, the condensates, waves seem to be harmonic condensates, and they, the, this type of pattern is at the center core of what I call the aurora star, which is uh, something that's similar to this, like but this would make it... This would make it perfect. An ocean of filaments within yes. an ocean. Yes. Yeah. Basically, hop vibrations over hop vibrations over hop vibrations, because you got the torus right here, which is a hop hop vibration, and and you can flex these fields. You can flex it, and that's what flexing your kundalini or flexing your um uh your chakras. See a squatter man in it too. <laughs> oh yeah, squatter man right here, squatter man baby. I'm and and I just want to shout out to our sister channel, uh, the Electric View. Um, speaking of squatter man, so uh man, we have a lot of channels and a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, also see, look right down here, the one that's between um this the one down at the bottom. With, with the red and the blue, that is also present in uh, right here. This the nope to the right. One more. The, your other right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm like pointing at it with my cursor. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. that's the one right there. Is right in the center of that. Is <laughs> okay, so. This is really important, these confinement domes and these choke rings. Um, as far as bubble sculpting goes with the choke rings um, and the open shapes that I'm working on, uh, I never realized this, but dude, these these the laminar flow and the vorticity of it is empty. Don't tell me that folder is empty. Put them all in that folder. <laughs> Oh, that's another folder that says bubble sculpting. There we go. So, where specifically? I was talking about these pinches before, and here's the Florida leaf, or the Florida Lee. I don't even know how to pronounce it per correctly, but then you got the Maltese cross. There's the pinch ring in the center, but there are four sheets, four sheets that come together and come back out this way in like an hourglass shape. And then um, I'm starting to do chain mail, basically introducing chain mail to bubble sculpting. And I'm realizing that these ring currents are all over. Oh, this is some of the work from Kaliman. Oh, it's so Starting similar. with the sphere bubble, buddy. Yeah. What's that? You're starting with a, a sphere, and then you're pinching it off to make these shapes. Oh, every single one of them is different. Um, I can turn all of these into bubble sculpting, just these shapes individually, because I know how to do it now. I can bubble sculpt each one of these individually. Um, so I'm going to get a hold of Kaleem and myself, uh, Gabriel Kaliman and show him how my work is similar to his and how we're working on similar paths. Uh, these, if you guys have ever work, seen these moving. Do you, do you work with air and high fill uh, personally by chance? Uh, not personally, no. I love what he's doing with the uh, ice somatics uh, and I'm I want to try to replicate it in spheres. 
instead of plates and desks. I, I have think, the means uh, to. I have the means to I think do if it right now. Him and David got together. It'd be amazing what they could do. Oh yeah, yeah. We're we're hot on top of each other. Uh, you know, anytime anybody's putting some stuff up, we're uh, we're liking it, sharing it, you know, loving it, spreading it in the community. Um, you know, Nassim Harriman is is. You know, th there's a lot of people looking our direction, and it's gonna go where it's gonna go. Um, but a lot of people have received funding around me uh, from different people who are part of this movement, and I'm very reluctant to uh, to incorporate myself because I like to be uh, not not uh, what is it not affiliated. I'm not affiliated with Robert, absolutely yeah. anything. Yeah, be independent. Independent. No, no strings attached. No, like you're telling well, me to no do strings, this. Just <laughs> we yeah, baby. Nothing. We only. Oh, <laughs> oh and, man. Uh, yeah, I would think uh, I wanted to, if I could, if I may, get into mm -hmm. the algorithmic, the algorithmic uh, filaments and how. Oh, they let me go are... back to your image here. I uh, like that what you shared. Is that what you want to talk about? Uh, just how the turtle field is, it's a frequency or a uh, chain of numbers, I assume, that's an algorithm, which would mean there's a beginning and end. Yes. But, and, there's and, a then, few... and, and, and then through, and throughout the fluctuations of the, or it's a rather a push and pull, beyond, you know, in between the fluctuations, there's an composition to encompass even more, hence the expansion and the symmetry. If that yeah, makes it's, sense. Yeah, it's it's all helical, and the uh, the the number codes are coming in. Uh, there's a lot of different ones that are being created. There's there's uh, specifically uh, the rodent coil is one. There's a bunch of different ones, and nobody really has all of the answers that's the thing and anybody who thinks that they do are really ignorant and they need to open their horizons and be more humble uh oh, so never be done learning until i'm going. right <laughs> uh and that's right. one thing that makes this uh yes can you, this is can you hear test? me it's lori lori hey it's lori, lori. Yeah, i decided to uh turn my microphone on <laughs> hey girl you're kind of you're talking, you know, my language now. This is something I've been working on with this, the Taurus structure, and mm -hmm. I've been writing my own software, and I've been, I put a few uh, links up in, in the chat here. And really, uh, this structure, that Taurus structure, is um, it's a Taurus knot, you know, K-N-O-T, Taurus mm -hmm. knot. And uh, it's so. all about the number of turns around the Taurus uh, versus the number of turns through the torus, and that's what makes that the pattern that you see right in the middle of the screen there, which I just put a link. I just generated one and put it up in in the chat, which uh, you know it's on my website. So yeah, so it's interesting. It's an interesting geometry, and I'm working with a guy from Greece who's basically claiming that this is the geometry of the magnet, right? And that gets into the work of Ken Wheeler. Right. right, and, and the hypertrophoid the pattern, entropy. which is obviously there, right, mm -hmm. and and he's basically saying that's you know that's the uh, geometry of the electron, of the atom, of you know at every scale. Yeah. So this is you know obviously the, you know there's one geometry that practically gets mapped to. So every scale. this is for the, for those who don't know, this is Lori. Uh, Lori is also known as Fractal Lady and Fractal, fractal woman. woman. Fractal Woman, my bad. <laughs> I and am she, a lady. <laughs> fractal woman, and she, yeah, and nice. she definitely. Uh, uh, let me just do a tiny little intro real quick. Um, and she, she has met Ken Wheeler and has been really into this. And I met her in 2017 at the very beginning of my uh, my tour uh, that I that ended up connecting this group and the Electric View. All things were created out of that year. Um, interestingly enough, so, and you, you are very familiar with the work of Eric Dollard and, yep. 
um, and a lot of what's going on. So you're you're in the know, and yep. uh, you've created, you've cre you've uh, written books, and you write soft or written pa papers, and papers, also you write yeah. software as well. Yeah. So I'm developing. So the the images that I showed in the chat are from software that I'm developing right now. So Is I'm this, really interested uh, where, in this torus knot geometry. Which which images are yours? Uh, just the torus ones. So there's a couple. The very last one in the chat I just put up. I just generated it and put it up. And then there's the spinning torus structure, which is on my YouTube channel. It's actually a uh, not listed, but it, so I'm just sharing it with you guys just for now. Okay. Uh, it's a spinning torus. Basically, it spins inside out, and it also spins uh, counterclockwise or clockwise, depending on which uh, view you're at. So I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to. OK, here we go. Yeah, if you click there on, we go. Yeah, so oh. there's the image. I couldn't get out. <laughs> I was stuck. <laughs> right. So that I just generated that with my software and, and put it up on my FTP site so you guys could see. Uh, okay. But also click on the link above that, because that shows a little animation, right. a little YouTube video. So if oh. I can get what you're saying correctly, Basically, what you're saying is the amount of threat, the amount of current that's going in on the top, has threads that like thread into the heat, the um, the helicity of the coil of the toroid, and then it's that's exactly what depends on the frequency and the power yeah. source. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the well, number it's, of, it's just like a it's normal like a bobbin. Coil. Yeah. Is it like a bobbin? Like a when bobbin. A yeah. button and a sewing machine. Yes, this is. Oh, yes. please, yes, describe this to us because I've been having. You can ask Buddy. Like I and I actually yeah. even made a okay. video so, about and it. This, right, and this also looks like the rodent coil, right? Mm -hmm. And so basically, what you're seeing are the number of turns. Like depends on the pattern you see. Depends on the number of turns around the circle, around the mm -hmm. torus, and yeah. the number of turns through the torus. So if yes. the number of turns around equal the number of turns through. You just get a circle. You don't see a torus. Yeah. So the number of turns around have to be different than the number of turns through in order for you to see this sort of hyper hypertrochoid pattern, which the Ken Wheeler calls. And then um, eventually these, and then eventually these turn into um, a cup or a human or a dog yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Or so anything. Map, yeah. And basically, yeah. it's the I believe it's the geometry of the magnet, and that's what Ken Wheeler's been saying all along. Yeah. And that's where I'm yeah. working with a guy from Greece who's do actually working on his thesis, and I'm you know helping him out um, because I like helping people, <laughs> and, uh, and you, so I'm generating images for him. So you were also um, uh, talking to me about uh, uh, being in uh, Terence's group, the collective there. Uh, yep, you guys yep. still meeting up? Uh, we haven't met up in a while, but we did. We had one meetup, one Skype call, which was really nice. And I've been in touch with Terrence directly via email. So they've been really busy. So we haven't done anything in a while, but we're definitely going to get, you know, do a meeting sometime soon. So nice. they're doing some pretty cool stuff. You've probably seen, you've probably already seen what, what they're trying to do. Right. And so the only thing that bothers me about the whole Terrence thing is this, you know, one times one, one, times equals, one equals two. two. Which <laughs> I've been like arguing with him for months now about this, right? And and I figured out because like he's really smart, right? He's not a dummy. Yeah. But he's not a mathematician either. Mm -hmm. And so I think I figured out that what he's talking about is wave interference. Yeah, and yeah. Not, he's not talking about theory. he's not talking about the multiplication operator in mathematics. Okay, so I'm trying to convince him of this that he's really talking about. <laughs> so when you, it's really wave addition. So you know when you have two waves and you you add them to like when they constructively interfere with each yeah, other. Nest, wave nesting, harmonically right? constructive wave, wave nesting. nesting. And that's, yeah. He talks about wave conjugation. So I know yes. like talking about wave conjugation. But he's using the word mul multiplication, which is wrong. It's really wave addition. So one plus one equals two, not one times one equals two in in con wave conjugation. So you know <laughs> he wrote this crazy giant book, trying to convince everyone, right? Trying to convince everyone that one times one equals two, when really he's talking about wave interference. And we Everyone, all... listen, Lori. I was working with Terrence for years before you guys got to connect, and 
everyone has told him about the one times one thing. Yeah. He, he it's fine if he wants to ride it and wear it yeah. as, as his cloak. Um, yeah. as he as he gallops, literally. I mean, he's he's like I. But it, it's, he's, it's he's the a, emperor he, with no I'm clothes. Not, I'm not it's dissing the, on him or anything, but seriously, yeah, it's, it's like the, it's the emperor. Like I'm not playing the emperor. I'm not going to pretend that the emperor is wearing clothes when he's not wearing clothes, right? And I kind of used that analogy with his his um, coworkers, and they thought it was funny. But I think <laughs> you know they're kind of because I think they're kind of placating him a little bit, just letting him have that because there's other stuff he's doing that's really cool, like yes. you talked about the bubble right. in all that you know and trying to it's, you know recreate the universe theory. using vortex technology and the technology they're developing i don't know if you saw any of that stuff is really cool right uh, so i didn't he, see the tech that they're working on no yeah no well that's he they disclosed that to me and and um this other guy jeff yi who who's also uh, i'm working with him as well he's jeff yi you should check out his youtube channel because um, he's developing a theory, a wave theory of particles, right? Okay. And so like, it's more in line with what we're talking about. There's standing waves, particles are standing waves, and light is a traveling wave, and there's everything in between, you know what I mean? So it's a Jeff. wave model. Y Jeff Yee? Yep. Yep. That's Energy him. wave theory? Yep. So, you know, he's doing more, you know, using standard physics, you know, like trying to take the constants of nature and reusing them to build this model. So I'm trying to help him build his model as well. So you oh, know, I just want to reiterate, if anybody who's not talking, please mute your mic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I you know, so, I'd highly recommend his channel. As well. Okay. He's, he talks about everything, like light charge waves energy you know he's trying to map it all out um and he's very uh his videos are very good like he speaks very well let's say and yeah he's very calm and very uh precise about what he's yeah saying. So i think he's his videos are very good nice yeah chris is chris is really cool i love working with chris yeah chris seeley I mean, that's yeah. a different person, but I'm just well, saying. No, but he's on uh, Terrence's group. Right. Right? And, yeah. Uh, and there's another guy, David. David Dave. Johnson. Yeah, David Johnson, that's it, yeah. Yeah. So they're great. I, I really like them. I got I really got along great with them in our meeting, and, and I've been in touch with them quite a bit, you know, offline. Yeah. Yeah, David speaks high of, highly of you. I remember oh. uh, when we first, when I first met David and I introduced uh, you when we first had a a group, I think we interviewed you on the Electric yeah. View. Yeah. But that was after David was on the Electric View. Oh. Okay. Um, he, he was on the he was on a, to begin with. But anyway. Oh, that's why I guess that's why they, you know, let me be on their team then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, hey, it, I'm so I'm I'm uh, I'm happy that you're uh, that you're able to get to uh, the, the ins and outs of some of that in, information. Um, as we all grow our tentacles into, uh, into different directions, cause we, we, we can only handle so much and I'm glad you're, uh, you're, you're out there doing it and, uh, and you can be a voice for, for us, uh, to, to hear some of the, some of the yeah, stuff, the maybe not. The is, like, there's not a lot of women in this field. Like, obviously you probably figured that out. Uh, hi Heather. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh... You know, it's nice to see so you know another woman sort of on this chat because generally, like when I I, Thank I you. check, <laughs> I check. Nice usually, to meet you too. <laughs> usually, there's I, Tess too, and Tess is awesome. Okay. So all three ladies, yeah. Good. Well, they, yeah. You should check out maybe my YouTube channel and like I so I checked out the demographics of my YouTube channel and it's a hundred percent male, right? Like which means like <laughs> which means that. Like there might be a few women, like I've got almost 2,300 subscribers, so there could be 10 women and they'll still say 100%, right? Yeah. Um, but they're, you know, and once like somebody subscribed and it was Julia something, I'm like, yay, it's a girl. And I checked, no, it's a guy named Julia. <laughs> <laughs> but well, anyways, I, gotta... I will definitely support you and, and come you. check you out, Lori. That's awesome. Thank and uh, I totally agree and it, that we are outnumbered and yep. it's, it's very awesome to, because um, like if I was on the original 
crew of the um, Electric View too, and I was the only woman at that point, and I stepped off to do some things on my own and then to come back and see Tess there and see other other women participating. I was like, thank God. Right. Thank right. Goddess. Or, thank so. Goddess, exactly. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Well, I'll check yeah. you out. But anyway, I, like I, 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 I have to go right now because my I'm in my office and I'm not plugged in and my, my computer's gonna die any second now. So <laughs> um okay. but well, I just wanted to say, I wanted to, you know, say hello and say my two pieces and uh, you know, I will, you know, maybe try to be more regular about coming on this group. Hey, you're on the call. I'm going to call you every week if you answer okay. it or if you don't. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Love All you, girl. Right. Thanks for being on again. Great. Talk Great. to you soon. Great to you, buddy. Bye. Okay. Ciao. All right. Bye. 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 So, yeah, <laughs> when legal when weed was legal in Canada, we were smoking, uh, Lori, <laughs> Lori and I. She's like, here, here. I'm like, yes. I just met her, and I'm like, you got any smoke? Because I had to go through the border. But I'm pro weed. She's pro weed. We're all anybody. It's pretty much all legal here in in the United States almost now. So, um, awesome. So James, uh, is it okay if I can talk more about the interference patterns? Yes, please do. Uh, we can talk directly about his book. Uh, and if you want, we're gonna have. Uh, I think we're gonna have him on the show. Heather, you had some amazing insights, or Lori, uh, both of y'all have um, awesome insights, um, but thank you. Um, but so, so we create these interference patterns, which is due to the imbalance of the charged particles, right? Or, or you know, them pushing and pulling against each other, and hence the uh, refraction of the light of the minerals and or whatever you have in the air um what what's really what how did you draw these conclusions for instance like uh i i do i like to they watch the planes and their trails that they leave, whatever they may be, um, and their dissipation and or uh, compression. And uh, I think it's. I just thought it would be a good example of what she was talking about. And uh, yeah, like. Then we are interference patterns, technically. And yes. Diatoms and or diatoms. It's very interesting. I don't know why it doesn't say video here. Usually it always pops up. Um, here's what I have to say. Here's what I have to say about that. Oh wow, it doesn't even come up anymore. That's strange. Looks like they uh, they took it took it off of the off of the top of the list. My video. Hmm. They hacked it. Yeah, I was looking for the first one. The Doherty set it usually comes up. Hmm. All right. Um, um, I was gonna talk about the interference patterns and why I believe and how I came to the conclusions. Uh. Or if Heather wanted to talk about it, I'd love to hear what she has to say. Oh, look, I've never subscribed to my channel. Yay! About interference patterns? About yes, the, ma'am. The, the wave interference patterns? Yeah. Um, the way that they look to me is kind of like a three-dimensional loom. And I loved how she was talking about, uh, everybody was talking about the um, entrance of the strings from the north, or we'll, we're just going to refer to it as the north and the south pole because that's the easiest way to visualize it, right? So north, north, south, top or bottom doesn't really exist. So, it, so it's coming in from the top and then it's kind of integrating itself into this pattern. 
um, like a loom card, right, with, with little holes in it, or um, like the original computer slips with the cards with the little holes that tell you, give, deliver, you know, this, this goes through, this is blocked. And then those wind up weaving together into matter, whether it be, it, the, I guess the, the type of matter, the state of matter that it is would, would be determined by the pressure on the outside and how, how it's hand from the outside or how it's handling, like how, how tight the knots are. That That's kind of how it feels and looks and I, I, I see it. That's how it looks to me. I like your interpretation. You're very eloquent. Oh, thank you. I like it. It's cute. So if you were to um, uh, um, envision like what you were saying, a chemtrail or envision it like projective, the projective geometry of how waves work as a condensate inside of the Doherty set, this is it right here. Um, and and this is this is 100 percent all uh golden ratio golden scaling it's the scaffolding of uh of how waves uh basically move off of the the center and uh here is the the cascading um primer wave so matter just doesn't just appear it forms it's a process it's a process crystal and and it and it comes into existence and and then it through interference patterns through wave interference um and uh, through constructive and destructive wave interference it produces um a dynamic vorticity that which is the wave and and the wave each one of them is alive and it and it and it's half alive and half dying but the scale on which it's alive the life giving vort vortice on which it's alive is different than the death vortice uh vorticity and uh basically you can look at this as the dielectric inertial plane and this is how matter condenses and there there's a whirlpool right here that i refer to as the generative uh vortex which comes out of the center from from there's the nucleus and it breeds and it moves outward and this so so this is this is the generative and this is the radial because it's moving out it's moving from the center out and it's the, the death part of the uh, destructive yeah so you have you have a uh, life and death or uh like you said uh c well it's an amplification of like uh charge and expansion opposed to reduction i think i don't know and what's interesting is where these meet <laughs> where these two vortices meet um from this point to this point to this point is exactly phi and that's the large point. And I believe that's what gives matter um, mass. This is exactly what gives matter mass is, is that. And there is... Uh, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm failing on the loss of words, but this whole thing breeds <laughs> nested loops of, of waves that are inter-nested waves that work in quaternion symmetry, which is quarter scaling waves downward. And those are the octaves. This is, this is the octaves as, as sound and as vibration, but um, as a filament as well. So you have the filament type of nest type of uh, um, element. So you have the filament frequency, you have the fractal element, this is kink instability. Kink instability um, on a plasma uh, scale is what science refers to it when helicity wraps up um, and it creates this, this type of helical structure. But you can also see it in shells. And this is in Peter with infinity theory. And so you can take this as a spicule um, or projective wave dynamics. And... 
I can hit play and this comes into motion here partially anyway or breaks up into there's the the first mode there's the second mode that's nested there's them together and there's the life and death vortices or the negentropic and entropic vortices that's it inside of the toroidal shells that are housing um which are the ninth and 11th toroid off of the center there's all there every single part of it every single part of the whole universe is unique we're finding uniqueness on every single scale this this idea here with the doherty set and the doherty network is providing an opportunity for all things to be 100 percent unique and i think that it's unique because each one of the humans are unique each one of the atoms are unique all the way down to an atomic level but you can see some of the dynamic geometry here and it has to be dynamic here's the four texture or the forest of vortices and you can see the toroid within a toroid within a toroid um toroid 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 nested on all scales and this comes directly out of the doherty set uh i just basically colored put it on a light table and uh sketched it out there it is again very simple beautiful elegant way to describe the um the quaternion symmetry and the wave nesting um that dan uh dan winter talks about wave nesting Oh, Dan Winter. I love. I like how he uh, talked about uh, the uh, the therapy. The therapy. Therapy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and how it, uh, plasma therapy can be very benefit more, like much more beneficial. I, I agree with this. Is uh, yeah, I agree with that one hundred percent. Being that so, electric things and, uh, you know. so this shows it's open this shows it's definitely open um and uh there's there's ways for the four winds the four directions the four corners to open and scale and cascade downward uh which a lot of religions refer to those four winds the four trade winds so here's how it starts all motion is uh, movement from one point to another there's the the you have to have you um preponderance so that's what gives life the pulsation is the preponderance there's a preponderance in the generative vortice to uh tor then there's there's a preponderance which means more energy in the life giving but it's shorter than the death vortice or the uh, entropic vortice we only see the death we mostly see the death and we hardly pay attention to the life part of the wave um and just in general um because there's a lot more of it to see we can see a lot more of it and we are part mostly composed of uh the death part of the vortice after the uh the con con uh concretion or wherever they come together where the waves meet right here so you have to in order to have a dipole or anything living any living system you have to have a preponderance of energy flowing from one side of it to the other which keeps the system open so you can see the preponderance of energy here obviously uh and that's we like to see it as half and half like yin and yang it's not it's more like this, and this is exactly what it is. And it's nested uh, vortices within nested vortices, like nested waves within nested waves. But you get to the center of the heartbeat of a wave, and this is it right here. It's this diamond shape, um, spicule, uh, that, that keeps things running and, and pulsating. And I used to think that you couldn't have a living body like a living human. Um, unless it had a heartbeat pulsating through it, but they have living humans now. Um, I know they have living humans now <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that they took this guy's heart out and he has blood flowing through it constantly. It doesn't pulsate. It just flows. It flows constantly. 
there's no pulsation to it. I thought that you had to have pulsation in order for the rest of your body to live. But the guy, his personality changed, granted, and he's like, he's a little stale. But, but like, they, they have, he's a living human, and they took his heart out, and it, it's flowing right. continuously. It's weird. I thought this guy had uh, died, uh, let's see, about four weeks after the surgery occurred. Oh, I didn't hear that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At least that's what well, I but yeah, that might be the same guy. It might not. And hey there, Brighton. Haven't talked to you in a bit. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Hanukkah, whatever, bar mitzvah. Happy New Year's. Happy holidays. <laughs> time to celebrate because the sun's gone around the world one whole time. We've done a helicy. Yep. We've we've complete completed the helicoid, the the loop. So I was talking about preponderance, preponderance and direction and basically propulsion, the propulsion and the heartbeat of a wave. And I have so much information to share, but this is literally sculpted nothing out of, but not out of nothing but spheres. So if you believe that everything is spherical propagation, which a lot of some of my um, favorite colleagues believe uh, that I'm studying, Everything is spherical propagation, which builds up the scaffolding of uh, the the structure of things and the the helical vorticity, you know, nature of whatever. So, and and Ken Wheeler's right, you know, and how uh, partially right, and you know, I'm not going to say everyone's always right, always, but um, this is a model of a black hole, a Kerr black hole according to uh, um, Pet Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose did a model like this and called it a Kerr black hole and showed the dynamics of that. So there you go. One more for the pinching. Of, there's the pinching, the Z pinch of the uh, wave amplitude. So what does give mass, matter mass? I think it's that, that little shape That's right the there, the heartbeat. Mm -hmm more dynamic geometry of the the star tetrahedrons well, i'm feeling like because there's like this pressure right okay so like i want to take your take your vortice picture with the with the two funnels right where it's a triangle on the top of a triangle like a cone on top of a cone and then there was another two that were uh perpendicular to it and then i this here i go on my weird tangent please bear with me here but uh, put the zodiac over the top of them so that Capricorn is at the top of the the death spiral and um, oh. Cancer is at the is at the birth spiral because Cancer is um, two things a it's it's the summer solstice so it's the longest day of the year and it's known as like the life giving the birth the it's ruled by the moon the mother the um, the life giving force right right and then Capricorn is um, the winter solstice and it's the it's the the darkest point and it's it's um well it's it's represented as the devil but the, by saturn like devil the, the card uh but it's it's um saturn is is who rules it so it's very very interesting the way that the pressures go down because i i i think that a lot of the ancient symbolism and a lot of the way that, that the astrology was interpreted when it was the science had a lot to do with these pressures and that the symbols that were used are actually descriptive of the mechanism they're insinuating so yeah. if you look at the symbols and as to what they're doing so the symbol for cancer is also like um a it's like a 69 kind of right like mm -hmm. it's this, it's this recurrent, dude heather current vortices like feeding into each other just kind of like what you're showing and mm -hmm. then the sign for capricorn is like a a v with a weird uh little loop coming coming off of it you know what i'm saying like taken out of and uh, extinguished almost kind of to go that way and, and then it goes in because I, I i think it's also a sentence this this is descriptive of how the energy moves around around the um circumference of the sphere and it, it there's actually evidence for it in in what's in those areas of space and the type of energy that they're pulling and taking and stuff like this so i think that they had greater 
the people who developed these symbols and the understanding of, of astrology had a greater understanding of that pull and what, what's actually physically happening in space and to us at that, those points in time. And if you put your, your image on t- if you put like a, a zodiac, which I, I did, but I, but it's really clear and, or not very clear and messy, but um, if, if you put them over, they're very, des- it's, it's very descriptive of what, what you're, what you're saying in the, about the death, um, in the death spiral right and mm-hmm. the life spiral and where where they come from and then the pressure on the other on from the sides pushing mm-hmm. pushing that in am i, am I making sense am I like yeah on? yeah absolutely here's uh, here's a here, field and it's totally necessary uh all, all i kept thinking was uh um so anybody who doesn't know heather heather stargazer uh she she is definitely on the fringes of discovery uh, with a lot of the things that she's working with as well. Uh, same as, I mean, in, in order to be a woman in this field, you have to be, uh, honestly, same with Lori, um, fractal woman. Uh, they're both very, very astute. And uh, it's a blessing to know both of them uh, and to have them on the show. No, but. Thanks. But yeah, so Heather's Heather's YouTube channel uh, and how she goes and explains how how what she was just explaining a little bit really, really hits home uh, on the Nordic runes and the number of hatches and what uh, electromagnetism is. Um, I think her I think what she's what she's explaining has a lot of validity and so does. Um, Dr. Anthony Peratt, he, he gave her, uh, accolades for, um, for showing him some of her research. So just wanted to say that. Thank you, buddy. That is mm-hmm. awesome. Um, I did, I, I, uh, haven't made a video on the astrology, uh, symbols and aspects yet. I've, I've actually started it a few times, but I did do, I did do one on the own the um irish alphabet and that's what that's what he's talking about it's called like the fuse because um i think that ancient and, and it and it's it's actually supported all, all around um if you if you just kind of tilt tilt the lens just a little bit it's like wow well so much comes on because um they if, if you look at the if you look at the om as um diagrams as radio frequency diagrams they um and and you look at the cairns because that's really what's important if you if you look at the ancient megalithic cairns in ireland you can start to see that they they might have been um audio amplifiers and and receivers for energy like receiving and processing atmospheric energy into usable power and some sort of communication worldwide and it ties into the pyramids and everything, but I haven't gotten that that far yet. But that's that's what Buddy is talking about. What I've been doing. Yeah, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah, and it's incredible when you watch the videos that she has already. Um, how can I share your uh, your channel? Please share your uh, your thing, and I'll put it in the comments below. Uh, um, yeah. Heathen Please Smith. do just. Okay, sorry. What? I'll put it in there for you. Yeah, put it in, and then a shout out too. Yeah, please. Let us hey, know buddy, can you hear me? This is Brian. Hey, Brian, what's up, man? How you doing? Excellent. I've been sitting silently. I was I was pulling a bright, and I really wanted to see. You. I'm working on my listening skills. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Heather, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, you're absolutely right with what you're talking about. Um, uh, harnessing. Hang on, uh, hang on, Brian. Brian, hang on. I have to interrupt you because I have a special thing with Heather with you. This is this is Brian, not the other Brian, but the you know the Brian Lee, not the other oh, Brian, Brian Lee. Even not <laughs> Brian. Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, so That's I finally okay. got in touch, and he's on the he's on the show now. <laughs> uh, and now this is is this Lily Luke and Wyandotte then? Yeah, this is yeah, yep. Excellent. I, I'm, I'm just memory. working on my memory too. Yeah, great um, memory. Now, I, I wanted to add to a point of her work and her research, which might even help you, Heather. Uh, what you're talking about, I, I found 
Um, Africa has them, uh, the upper, lower, lower, southern, southwestern part of Africa, the upper Egypt area of Africa, the, um, the Celtic region, um, like Scotland and stuff like that, um, you know, where the Stonehenge is, all these different spirals. Now, they thought they were dwellings. Um, but they were actually stones. And somehow or another, I can't remember how the first one happened, but the guy was doing like a tuning fork or something, found that each one of the stones in these spirals all held a note perfectly, like a B, an A sharp, you know what I mean? A C, a D, a B flat, you know, you know blah, blah, blah. Um, but they, they started looking at these. Now, this is an interesting thing that I thought was they all showed up on a grid pattern on the vortices that we talk about, the natural um, energy grid vortices in the earth. And also, here's the bizarre thing. They were using them to make gold and draw the gold out of the earth because everywhere they have found these spirals from, um, there's the other part, Peru, South America, Peru, Argentina, and then I want to say Alaska, same thing, where they find all these different spiral patterns. Now in Scotland and Ireland, Heather, they are more squared off. They are, you know, more of the masculine. In the Peruvian and the Argentina areas, they're very feminine and rounded, and in the lower area of Africa as well. But they find gold in all these spots, and I thought that was interesting. And and when yes. you you spike you spike my my interest, I've been sitting quietly, but I, I I wanted to add that maybe somehow or another that might help you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. You have to watch my video because gold is an integral part of it, and and um. It's very interesting, and I and thank you. I will look at I will look at that. That, that that's interesting. The male and the female, because there's something to the curvature of the Earth and the way that these things were received, and in the the polar horns, and there's also um, in Mexico as well. There's um, there they were actually found cairns in Mexico that were identical to the cairns in Ireland, and people still presently exercising the religion. Um, and they showed them pictures of the Irish cairns and they, they referred to them as home in, in their native tongue, they referred to them as home. And so they took the, the people from Mexico to Newgrange and I think like 2003 or something like that. And uh, they, they performed their ritual um, at Newgrange. So that's, that was really, really interesting, interesting work. Um, wow. Yeah. So yeah, please. And uh, thank you for your. Are you Brian, Brian, can I my, uh, let my me phone. say two things real quick? Um, I, I just I don't want to be rude, but your voice is just a little bit too a little bit too loud. You don't have to speak as loud. We can hear you perfectly oh, with okay. whatever. It might be yeah. the way my mic is positioned. I got right, a better right. voice. Thank you. Yeah, might be. It thank might be the way your much. mic is too. I'll yeah, I had to bring it down. <laughs> I had to bring that up. <laughs> I love you to we'll, death. We'll get the Barry so, White out of it, man. We'll bring in a little more Barry White and Jonah. There, there we go. Um, uh, uh, but, and one more, to... one more thing. Hang on, one more thing. This is Heather's book right now. Um, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but I was just bringing up Heather's book. Uh, you can see it online or. I don't know if there's also ways to purchase it as well uh, through. Oh, awesome. It's but, yeah. definitely going to look into it. Yeah. So you, anyway, uh, I can, that she I can put that, that in the link. Irish. Heather, I can put that in the link if you wish. Oh, or wait, you. no, it's probably too big. To, well, I can put some. Um, of you can put sure. the link to the. You, you can put the link to the to um, becoming borealis. Like where they can download it because it's a. Okay. It's a it's a free PDF copy, downloadable PDF copy. It's just an ebook. Oh, beautiful. And uh, yeah, so and thank you for your interest. And then I also did link in the um, Heathen Stargazers YouTube, and you know, there's there's a no, Facebook. No, no, but wait there, wait, wait yeah, there, right there and back it up yep. to the codes and stuff in the alphabet. Yeah, you were just that. Yeah, because is... I found that interesting, and that was another point. The Hebrew alphabet lays out exactly according to the DNA helix of our DNA. And in the 22 codons, question, you got to, you know, split, divide all the vowels with them. But in the 22, you might, you might want to, I don't know how well versed you are in Hebrew, but uh, you might want to look into that and the symbologies that you got with the Irish alphabet. And, and, and look at it in this. Uh, there's a guy named Lynn Hayes, and he supports this as well. But it's not, there's a difference between a belief error, I think we talked about this last time, buddy, and an alphabetter. So the belief error believes that the back 
comes before the alif in the Hebrew language. And then the alphabet is the way the other one was. Those are the ones who came in with the tamol. But um, I think you would find that of major interest to kind of tie that Hebrew in there. And maybe the Hopi Indians. Those are the two oldest that I find that hold to the true vowels dialect um, of all the languages. But uh, I, I, I give the floor back to you. I just wanted to add in that one note. Thank and you very much. I wrote it work, down. Gonna... Thank you. <laughs> I definitely made a note. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we're here to share because what, you know none of us are complete, mm -hmm. and and we're open. And, and, you know, yeah, we thank you. Yeah, we're flowing. I, I like how yeah. that word came out. Even it's all flow, and it's an open unfolding geometry. universe. Yeah. And it's all unfolding. It's being written as everything is you know symbiotic to itself. You know, one thing dies, another one comes in. It's you know that kind of uh, uh, symbiosis. It's just it's it's unseparable, and uh, we're coming into that consciousness now. And, and field, you know, in field, it's funny that field um, equations and, and field technologies and and, and field um, consciousness are coming into being as we're losing alpha and beta. You know, polarity thinking, and there is no real polarities in a field. You know, in a, in a um, torus toroid cell, they're, they're working symbiotically at 1.618 unfolding. So I think it's kind of neat that the consciousness is unfolding as well at the time. I, great points. I cannot wait for Heather and um, and Fractal Woman to get down and talk some more for sure. Because <laughs> the name Fractal Woman, that just kicked butt. She's I mean, awesome. Yeah, these. I mean, I've been having an absolute pleasure on this 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 um, podcast. I really just listening. I had a lot of things that were going down today, and it was absolutely been beautiful to listen to everything. Everybody's been well spoken and well put and, and polite. Thank you all. This is the language you were talking about, the Hebrew language in a toroid. Yeah. And um, see, take and it all in. The bite of Aries. If you look at Aries, see that's the reason why I stumbled onto the the snake eating its tail, is because the Aries rams are actually showing you the unfolding of one split dividing curling to external. One split the body and curling back to centripetal. It's being sucked back to the it's center. Exactly. Floor. Oh my God. I need to talk to you more. I really would love to. We do. I, that's why I'm, I'm not even kidding when Buddy said there's a couple of meetings where we're supposed to meet in the person and everything fell through. You know, this is the way it goes. And um, But it's timing is now because really yeah. there's a lot that we can share in this. That's why I said uh, the last time we talked, Buddy, is. I was thinking about it all week. You remind me of my buddy, um, Al Ansel from school. And it was like, you were literally like talking to an old high school buddy I haven't talked to in years. And we were just kind of catching up on life. You know, it's really a beautiful three hours. Thank you for allowing that space. And, um, and, and, and Heather, we're, we are going to have a trilogy here. And um, I think it would be interesting to do like, like, you know, Howard Stern has the people in the room like to do that kind of a podcast where we actually have our energies in one room and, and sharing the dynamics of drawings and, and, and artwork and, and feel like you're doing with the Hebrew language and stuff right now. I could provide that on a professional level, possibly. I, I, I'm down. I'll, I'll, I'll drive, crawl, whatever. If somebody got to drag me by the bumper on the snow, I mean, brother, bumper ski, and I'm down with it. Like, uh, this in, is in not studio. Happen. This is our time. Like, in studio, I'm talking. Possibly. I'm trying to, I'm, I, I, I'm working on some things right now, so we'll see. Well, I got some mad skills in carpentry, and I've, uh, I've built acoustic studios before. I've built all kinds of rooms, we'll say, that you can grow in, you know, uh, metaphysically and, you know, mentally, and sound stages, and I've actually, you know, with the theater and stuff like that, uh, I've done some editing, blah, blah, blah. But I can help, you know what I mean? And this is all a sharing. And I'm I'm, that, I'm just excited to be here today. Last week it was amazing. Uh, I had to miss out. I got my son's two jobs. They wanted two jobs at one place where I knew both the managers. I mean, go figure. And uh, that was my last Saturday, so I'm sorry I missed it. But it was nice to catch up. You know how you put them out there, or you know during the week, so everybody can have them. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Um. Hey. I, can I, Can I just uh, I see this and I want to talk about it here. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So I, I as, thanks. I've had my introduction and everything. <laughs> um. So Asgard. Uh. What's with that space company that's like taking over space and don't they have like, uh, like aren't they building a civilization in space called Asgard or something? 
anybody hear that? You mean like a space station kind of thing? No, there's a there's a civilization on Earth where people have signed into it now. The intergalactic, Fed, not the intergalactic federation. It's like there's something uh, where they all signed into it, and it's a weird name. And I haven't heard it called Asgard yet, but um, I, I've heard you know words from you know other researchers that we you know obviously all fluent um, of of that kind of a grouping. I'm just looking at this. This is great. Heather, can you explain can you explain this picture with some of your insider? I mean, this oh, is out of your book. That's, that's Mount Miru. So I was just trying to show that the Buddhists um, had a very similar concept of the layers of the universe that the um, the other one is the the Norse. Uh, Asgard is, is, is yeah, oh, right so like okay. Asgard and the Nine Worlds is from Norse mythology or uh, lineage, we'll say, because I don't like to call it always mythology. But, mm -hmm. you know, like Midgard is the world that we live in and Asgard is the, you know, the Nine Worlds. Like, And so so Asgard is like the home of the gods. And so that's why they would call it that if it was a space station, because it would be like up in outer space in that other layer. And then there's like a rainbow bridge that go that connects the um, the layers. So when you when you pass you take the rainbow bridge and you wind up in one of these other realms according to how your spirit lived. That, that's how the Norse see it. And so the Buddhists see Mount Miru as kind of in a similar fashion that, that you, your, your uh, spirit goes through certain steps and then also like the subsequent underneath like super dense things, you know, the, the world of fire and smoke and the great darkness and stuff like that. So it's just really very interesting that civilizations on uh, uh, very different parts of the planet had the same conceptual basis for the universe, same ideas for the universe and how it's built. And it actually, oh, yeah. it's a, word, it's a, it's, it's a too word much of for it to be coincidence, you know, it's just amazing. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And Brian Holmes is a pleasure to hear from for sure. Um, yeah, Brian's great. It's great to hear from you too as well, Michael. Um, thanks for uh, coming on. We just got in touch last minute before. Oh, look at this nice picture. I would love to have that picture to look out of. Uh, <sighs> I, I love the way that they described <laughs> Asgard in in those movies, those Thor movies, how space is kind of like an ocean and ether in it of itself more than a empty void i just thought it was cool I yeah like idea. where was it right down here sydney you left and we saw your uh we saw your your window we were looking out your window it's a beautiful energy you got to look out there couldn't see it with you sitting there well, I'm, I'm glad you appreciated that. I, I set that up just for you guys. Hey, dude, I honestly, I, if you could just step off screen again for a second. <laughs> Hang on, everyone, look. Ah, what a gorgeous. Look at how day. nice that is. Yeah, what's the weather at like where you're at? Thank you for. Uh, uh, it's, most, it's mostly overcast. But if you notice, there's like a little bit of rise in the, in the uh, land. As you go back there where your arrow is, mm -hmm. on the other side of that rise, it goes down to a lake. Oh, nice. That's beautiful property. It's a uh, good, good window, man. What a, anyway, so <laughs> thanks for entertaining the, the thought there and the energy, spreading it around. Good vibes. So uh, I don't even know how long we've been talking because it stopped for a minute. Um, if anybody else wants to come up, or, or anybody else has anything else they want to say? Uh, particularly, there's plenty of time here. So if anybody has any direction we want to go, we yeah. never really. Hey, um, are, are you there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just come off a of mute. I just want to make sure I can be heard. Mm -hmm. um, we really do need to get together. I, I, you know, I don't show my work to, to like, really nobody. Um, but I, I, I've been compelled to want to show you my work, especially after that last uh, electric rarefaction um, compression sensor. You know, I mean that that, that compression uh, 
drawing that you showed where you know you got the blue and the red light energy you know compressing and 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 um the rarefaction in there for creating mm -hmm. an acoustical sound and um so i would like to, to share that stuff with you you're much more you know you're much more oriented to detail to make sure that everything's exactly a millimeter or centimeter apart but um but same exact work and two uh man i i know this sounds crazy but we're, hey we're on the geometric view you down for making a magic carpet? I got I, the fundamental means to split the bite acoustic um, octave measurements in the right uh, in the right patterning that we could actually make Aladdin's magic carpet. It's I, a mind blower, and, and that's in my work, and I want to show you, and I can actually show you how we split the bite the Z gate by uh, by the, the octave exchanges that we go uh, split the biting one a variable and then. Uh, you have to mimic it in two, uh, uh, two octaves um, exchanges in the same note, but in 11th measure split difference. And it'll cause cavitation to start, and you now become weightless. It's called zero point. You know that. But uh, I, really, we can achieve this. And I think if we all got together with Heather included, um, I, something about what she's got, I think, is going to be the catalyst for, you know, like a bind that ties, you know, three ropes that, you know, bound together make the strongest rope. But that's you. You asked. Right. I mean, that's. I know it's off the wall, bro. But I got. I've got all kinds of stuff to back up what I just said, and uh, it's time. You know. You know, getting that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's another gentleman that I've been in touch with quite a few people because I put myself out there. Um, and... Sorry, uh, uh, buddy. Can I? Uh, can I just step sure. in just for? Yep. Yeah. I. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the invitation. This is Donald Adams, Stock Stars, uh, SoundofStars.org. I, I prepared a bunch of materials, slides, diagrams, etc., for the presentation because you guys are talking about consciousness, and so a lot of the work that we've been doing is geared towards that. But uh, after hearing um, this for the last hour, I guess or a bit more, I, I think it would be too technically oriented and maybe a little bit dry uh, in some respects. But I wanted to thank you for the invitation. I, I've got a deck out, and so I wish you all of you guys a really good afternoon well thanks oh, for being thanks, here man. Pleasure. Doc, we'd love to see what you have um we can go into it right now if you want to uh, in brevity show us some stuff i i think it would take a bit uh it would take a while um there's areas that i suspect that your group and similar groups have either not been aware of or just haven't had access to i i, I get the sense that there's um heather stargazer i i i i I think a lot of the ideas that she has are on track. Uh, I can certainly see similarities with some of the direction she's going and with the work that we've been doing since 2007. Um, but uh, it's just, it would take a while. But what I would suggest is um, uh, if you guys have, and I think you're already doing it to a large extent, if you can synthesize what your current um, thoughts, uh, ideas are, with uh, some of the things that have been um, excavated, uh, you know, over the last while, like if, especially there's a lot of crazy stuff that was happening plus or minus 10 years in the 80s. A lot of it just went underground and it's pretty much vanished. Um, mm. So, but yeah, but I, but I just wanted to say I appreciate what you guys, um, you know, are addressing, and I just wanted to wish you the best and thank you for that invitation. Absolutely. Thanks for being here, Doc. Thank Hopefully we can... Uh... Nice. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right, see ya. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm, I'm excited for... Uh, uh, hopefully Doc will join in again. Um, he was good on the first one, showing, showing a lot of the direction of... Uh, um, I hope that wasn't an, an eternal farewell, is what I'm saying. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure he'll, he'll be back because he piqued my interest on quite a few different subjects and showed me some of the um, the origins of of the science, the names of the science of what I'm doing, the people who are coming up with it, like the people before Hartmut Mueller uh, who were working on it with, with global scaling. So anyway, um, yeah, it sounds like he's interested in, uh, in – Everyone loves what you have to say, Heather, because it's right on point and it's it it speaks our language because it is what language is. I did get a copy of your book, Thank Heather. Thank you. Oh, 
Thank you. I, I appreciate your support, you guys. This really, um, I, I appreciate it. I know it's like humbling, but there's a lot to do. And I think that um, we, we all do like have something to contribute and nobody can, no, no man's an island. So let's, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. It's really intriguing. It's really intriguing. And there's a lot of scientists and other people who've been re reaching out um, recently, including Garrett and his lab uh, out in Oregon. So that sounds that sounds like you know this this could go in a lot of different directions. Here. Sure. Get Jason Verbelli on here. And uh... oh yeah, yeah. I've been trying to reach out to him for an independent uh interview so eventually that might come but yeah we 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 see <laughs> verbelli's right on point too yeah he's a pretty smart guy um yeah and the guy who runs uh the searle research facility in colorado uh russell anderson i believe is another good one okay get on here but you've you've heard of a serial effect generator, have have Oh yeah. Yeah, the serial. Yeah, yeah, John Serial. Serial, yeah, serial effect generator. Um great example of uh the double like uh you know, variables in the double slit experiment and mm -hmm. how that works. Um so Michael Evans is doing his whole thing with sonic geometry too. Um, and, you know, you can speak life and you can speak death and it comes down to the ohm. Like, like how you, that universal feeling or sound that someone makes or the cat or the dog, they're like, mm, or <laughs> purring or. Any one of those bananas? Uh, oh yeah, and it's in the bananas too. That's right. It's we in the bananas, you. Pat. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think we should wrap it up unless unless anybody else has uh has some uh some other things we could we could touch on. I guess I want to have some closing remarks here and talk about how it's open and this is how open shapes are created: diatoms, um, the toroidal field, the nested. Uh, vortex uh, the that that right there, the snake eating its tail, the caduceus. This is all. This is all bubble geometry, sphere stacking, sphere kissing, and we're starting to figure out some of these geometries on deeper levels and fractals, filaments, frequencies. Thank you for being here, gonna, everyone. Gonna um, decode all of these uh, images. So they're all codexes, you know. It's beautiful. Yeah, hey, buddy, it's a, I, I would like to take this time while we're on here as you're doing closing statements, because um, mm -hmm. I do have to go as well. But thanks for all you're doing. I mean, really, um, you know, be, be, I, I, people don't realize how much effort it takes to just get one of these these out. Um, all the, the synchronicity that you involve, all the people that you've taken time to get linked to. I can't wait to add the people that I know and the different you know layers that I have to add to all this. But I just want to take the time to say thank you for inviting me, you know what I mean, for ever taking the time to listen and, and all your time that you do. I mean, really, sometimes we go on set and, and we get at the oddest times confirmations of are we doing any good, and you're doing good, buddy. Thanks, really I appreciate are, that. Yeah, I man, yeah. Bless you I all and um, have a great day. If, if not before, we'll talk to you next Saturday, brother. Yep. Sounds good. Everyone Peace good? Out, man. All right, guys. See you next week. Take Peace. care. Bye. 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 Great episode. All right. The loving energy grows. The group grows. We all grow. There's so much more to know. Just blessed to be here, sharing this content, and enjoying good conversations with friends, intellectual conversations that are leading to new horizons, new directions. The geometric view is 
Love is watching product. Love is watching production. Thank you for doing that. Executive producers, the Geometric View, our buddy James and Brighton Cotter. Music is by the acronym Beauty, the acronym B U D, and Abyssal Dionysus is the geometer. That's me and Brighton. Thanks for being here. Catch you next Saturday.